Bill Sterling, Tim Alexander, in for Dr. Bill Deagle today. Uh, later, uh, Chris Harris will be joining me. Um, okay, well, well, right off the bat, uh, I want to talk about something that if you're a Christian, uh, you uh, will find very upsetting. Um, you, everybody knows about the, uh, the conflict in Syria. Uh, the United Nations is trying to, to call it a civil war, but it's not really a civil war because a civil war implies that both sides are Syrian. The opposition is uh, overwhelmingly made up of non-Syrian mercenaries that uh, have been funded and recruited by the United States, United Kingdom, France, uh, by Israel, and by the Gulf Cooperative states, the uh, conservative monarchies. Uh, now, uh, the Christian minority, and they, about 10% of the people in Syria are Christian. Um, they're facing, and by the way, some are Orthodox, some are Catholic, some are Protestant. But the Christian minority in Syria is facing a growing threat. Thousands are being forced to flee their homes. Uh, they face uh, not just harassment, discrimination, but outright to perse persecution uh, and literally death uh, from the radical Islamic factions um, that uh, make up the, the mercenaries. Uh, at least 9,000 Syrians, 9,000 Christians from western Syria, a city of Quinze, were forced to seek refuge after an ultimatum from a local military chief of the uh, uh, one of the groups of the mercenaries. Um, and basically they told him that they had to be out of town um, by um, a certain day, and if they weren't, uh, it, it would be over for him. Um, some mosques in the city uh, were announcing from their minuets, from their loudspeakers, that uh, Christians must leave within six days, uh, which expires this Friday. That was uh, last week. Um, and two Catholic priests who uh, fled confirmed that, that they actually heard the uh, ultimatum with their own ears. Um, so your tax dollars are going to fund, arm, equip, support uh, Muslim extremists that are killing Christians and persecuting Christians because they're Christian. Um, they are receiving real-time satellite imaging data and all kind of sophisticated arms uh, from the United States and from uh, the Gulf Cooperative uh, Consuls and states and also from Israel and that's just unacceptable this is something that every pastor every Christian pastor uh, in every NATO state should be addressing uh, in their their Sunday services you, literally people by the many many thousands of people are their very lives and we're talking about unarmed men women and children their very lives are at risk because they believe in Christ. And this is being supported directly by American funding. And uh, that, and also British funding and French funding. And last time I heard, the United Kingdom, France, and the United States were predominantly Christian countries. And I don't think most people are aware of what's going on, nor would most of us support it. And I, for one, don't. Uh, I think this is very important, guys, and uh, please uh, bring it to your pastor's attention. And um, we need to put pressure on the various NATO governments uh, to cease and desist supporting uh, the Muslim extremists that are attacking the Christians uh, in Syria. Now, uh, I want to do a quick plug here. Um, I, uh, almost 30 years ago, began uh, claiming uh, my old, uh, this old Scottish title I have, Earl Sterling. Very long, complicated. I was Scottish editor at Burke's Peerage, a famous uh, 
genealogical and publishing firm uh, that deals with peerage titles in, in London. And uh, I also owned a castle in Scotland, uh, Greening Castle, which is believed to have been one of the historic sites of uh, Camelot. When I bought the castle, I bought it from the from Lord Lisa, Mar- the Marquis of Lisa, chief of the Kennedy clan, and there were two feudal baronies went with it. Well, I've sold the castle off and sold the newer barony title, which was about 400 years old, but the more ancient of the titles, uh, Baron of Grenon, uh, which is the Latin name, or Baron of Greenan, if you want to use the English name, is uh, about 500 uh, years old. It's one of the oldest titles in the United Kingdom. Uh, Scottish barony titles can be sold or can be inherited. And uh, they're the only title of nobility in the United Kingdom that can be sold. And in fact, the only title of nobility in the world that's recognized by a country that actually has a monarchy and all that, uh, that can be sold. And if you are interested, uh, you can go to my blog, Europe, uh, and there's a link to it. Um, and it's it's for sale at 55,000 uh, pounds, that's United Kingdom pounds. In dollars, it comes out to about $85,250 at the current exchange rate. Um, and then the person that owns it is... Uh, would be the Baron of Grenon, and his wife would be the Baroness of Grenon, Lady Grenon. Um, it uh, literally is connected to one of the ancient sites of Camelot. It's one of the oldest titles in the United Kingdom. So if you're interested in that, please go to my blog, Europe, and to get there, just simply do a Google search, Large Sterling Europe, and that will get you right there. And towards the top, um, there is an advertisement uh, that says, uh, let me see exactly what the ancient British title for sale. Okay, now we uh, continue to head towards a war uh, in Syria. Syria is the back door to a war with Iran uh, and to a general Middle Eastern war, uh, which will involve Syria, Iran, Lebanon, Palestine, Gaza, Israel, the Gulf Cooperative States, um, and almost certainly will involve NATO, Russia, China, and various uh, states aligned with them, and almost certainly will begin the Third World War. Um, they, you know, there's uh, the, the, the new French president, uh, who, like his predecessor, is Jewish, uh, is demanding that uh, uh, the UN approve a no-fly zone. Uh, that's not going to happen because the Russians and the Chinese will veto it. But uh, it looks increasingly like uh, the NATO will take action outside of the United Nations. And uh, Condoleezza Rice, for instance, has said that that will happen. She's the former U.S. Secretary of State. Now, when that happens, uh, Russia has... Um, a large number of troops, uh, two entire divisions that she's prepared to deploy, as well as a brigade of her, her commandos, her special op commandos. Um, one division is an airborne division, and another is a mechanized infantry division. Um, she also has a large number of troops uh, in Armenia to deploy into northwest Iran and uh, a, a sizable army of armored divisions ready to blast across uh, Georgia. Remember, she had, Russia and Georgia had a war about three years ago, uh, but which will go, they'll blast through Georgia, go into Armenia, and then into northwest Iran. Uh, you can also expect a large number of Russian fighters uh, and Russian anti-aircraft missiles being deployed. Uh, possibly uh, Chinese aircraft as well as Chinese divisions each. We'll have more when I get back.
reporting for Nutramedica reports. Uh, within the last week, uh, Russia has fired uh, two very serious warning shots. Uh, it launched a ICBM missile, uh, and then it also launched an SLBM missile. Uh, SLBM means it's a intercontinental ballistic missile that's launched from a submarine. Uh, the one shot was clearly seen all across the Middle East uh, in Israel and uh, throughout the entire Middle East because it was launched at night uh, and it was launched near there. Um, they've never done two of these uh, and two different uh, technologies involved. Um, and it clearly is a warning um, to NATO and the Western powers that they consider Syria and Iran to be in their strategic national interest. And they have used those words, and by the way, those are key code words in, in diplomatic language, which it basically means this is a matter that we will go to war over. Do not cross this line in the sand. And the Chinese have also used that term. The Chinese have actually said that they are prepared to enter into the Third World War if Iran or Syria are attacked. The insane part is this doesn't seem to be having any uh, effect on the Western and uh, Israeli drive uh, against Iran and against Syria. Now, the thing in Syria, this is a continuation of the so-called Arab Spring, which was cooked up uh, by the CIA and several leaders, uh, Jewish leaders of, of uh, Facebook and so forth, several uh, social networking things about a year before it happened. And, um, you know, you've had uh, the, the mess in, in Egypt, which is now, by the way, it's, it's gotten even messier because the... Their, one of their Supreme Courts annulled the parliamentary elections and the, the, the generals are back running the country. Um, but, uh, it, you know, uh, you saw what happened to Gaddafi. Gaddafi basically hadn't done anything to anybody. He was no favorite of mine, but he made sure that his people had the highest standard of living uh, in Africa and in uh, North Africa. Uh, now they no longer have that standard of living, and in fact, uh, the, the whole country is, is beset by sectarian violence. The Syrians are proud people. They're tough. Uh, they basically had whipped the foreign mercenary forces when the United Nations began demanding a, a truce. They agreed to the truce. Uh, and they pretty much tried to keep the truce, but the mercenaries did not. Finally, it got to the point a few days ago that Assad said, uh, the, told the mercenaries they about 24 hours to either adhere to uh, the UN a non-truce or they would be attacked. And they, the, the opposition announced that they would not abide by the truce, and now his forces are, are attacking them. Um, what has happened uh, in Syria is uh, there have been several false flag massacres, that is, massacres that they've tried to blame on the Syrian government that, quite frankly, the Syrian government had nothing to do with. They were the mercenaries that uh, the United States, Britain, France, Israel, and, the, and Saudi Arabia, and uh, some of the other conservative Arab monarchies have sent in. Uh, the king of Saudi Arabia is paying fifty to sixty thousand dollars a person for mercenaries from throughout the the Arab world, North Africa, to come in and fight um, the Syrians. Now that's a lot of money for most of those people. It's a lot of money uh, to Americans right now with the economy, the shape it's in. But uh, to people in Tunisia and Libya and so forth, uh, it is a king's ransom. And uh, the arms that are being delivered uh, are state-of-the-art. Um, they, it, The Syrian government tries to use its armored forces to go into its own cities, and they find tank trap after tank trap being set up with the latest anti-tank missiles. So they have to use helicopters or artillery. Um, and then, of course, they're accused of slaughtering their own people. Well, they've tried to get the people out of the area. 
you know, and I'm, I'm don't want to sound like a big defender of, of Assad or the Syrian government. I'm not uh, a firm uh, supporter of, of uh, most Muslim uh, states by any means. But uh, the truth is the truth, and, and the truth in this case is that the overwhelming majority of the people fighting against the government in Syria are foreign mercenaries, and they're being supported by foreign powers uh, as part of a globalist agenda to create a third world war and an Israeli agenda to create a regional war so that they can attack their enemies using American, British, and French, and other NATO forces to, to do most of the fighting and dying for them, so that there'll be an even bigger, greater Israel at the end of the day. I think uh, all this is insane, because uh, all sides have weapons of mass destruction. Um, the, uh, the colonel in charge of home, the Homeland Front in the greater Tel Aviv area uh, basically has admitted that if the Tel Aviv area and uh, the, there's about two million people very close to Tel Aviv, you draw the circle out for further, there's another uh, three million people, a large part of the Israeli population lives in that area. If it comes under attack by missiles in uh, that are controlled by Hezbollah in Lebanon by Syrian missiles and Iranian missiles, and there are literally about 100,000 rockets and missiles uh, at their disposal, that they will have to evacuate those people. Now, how do you evacuate uh, under uh, bombardment, by the way, uh, two or three or more million people? And there's no place to, to send them to other than the open desert. Uh, which is proof that Netanyahu and the other nuts in his government literally have not thought this through or could care less. Uh, they don't have a means to protect their own people, and they're going to get them slaughtered. Um, the Israeli Defense Force has basically set what their tactics and their strategy will be that they intend to target all launch sites in real time and to go after them very quickly. Well, that puts everything on a hair trigger because if you're Syrian or Hezbollah or, or Iran and you, your trump card is your ability to deliver weapons of mass destruction, I'm, I'm referring specifically to chemical, radiological, and advanced biological, as well as advanced conventional fuel air explosive warheads. And you know your sites will be destroyed unless you use them, then that puts a hair trigger on your use of those weapons. Uh, if weapons like that are used against Israel, it, Israel almost certainly will, will begin a barrage. Israel has hundreds of nuclear warheads. And all this is heading literally to the Third World War. We'll be back in a little bit. This is Tim Alexander, Lord Sterling. What a Alexander, the Earl Sterling, and Chris Harris, our nuclear expert, is joining me. Um, we want to talk about uh, Fukushima, uh, also especially about uh, the pool can, uh, number four, the fuel, fuel, used fuel storage uh, facility number four, because it literally is a grave danger to the entire northern hemisphere and ultimately to to life on this planet. Um, go ahead, Chris. You're you're the expert here. You know far more about about this than I. What what can what are we doing? What can be done? And where do we go from here? Uh, you know, I was listening. You know, last week John Moore came on with some shocking uh, news about people actually preparing to evacuate a large portion of Japan that may be affected by a collapse of Unit 4 spent fuel pools. And uh, 
you know, I'm, I'm, I was thinking about that. We talked about, and when I'm thinking about things like that, I'm also saying, well, what is going to particularly go wrong? Because, you know, in st- I guess what I'm going to say, my expertise is uh, I've been in the plants for, you know, close to uh, 30 years. I can, I can visualize what is the part that's going to break specifically, that one right there, you know, fix that. And that, that's really where, where I try to go when, uh, when we're talking about this type of uh, an event. And I, I feel if, we're, if something is going to collapse or something's going to break, it will be the fact that the reactor cavity seal, the seal that's around the reactor vessel flange, that's really not meant to withstand all the water that is been, not, oh, also, it's not meant to withstand salt water. I forgot to tell you. That's right. That's been filled up with seawater. So they're not using fresh water. They're using salt water. Right. That was done very early on. They filled that up with seawater. So, so they've got 14 months of, of, of highly corrosive seawater. Yeah, right. They just wanted cool and wet, and they didn't care if it was uh, uh, you know, a, a harsh environment of introducing a harsh environment to the uh, metal. So anyway, what we do have by, by TEPCO's own admission and by uh, data is that the there's something that's called a gate. It goes between the spent fuel pool. It actually forms part of the wall of the, ga- of the uh, spent fuel pool, and it separates the spent fuel pool from something called the reactor cavity, the, the refueling reactor cavity. If you can visualize, and I provided... Uh, a lot of drawings, and if you really want some really good pictures, go to nformable.com right now. That's E-N-F-O-R-M-A-B-L-E.com, and you, we just posted. We've been working on this thing for about three or four days now to get all the all the pictures and everything that, that would support this. You can see exactly what we're talking about. Now, around the, the reactor vessel is inside the containment building. If you can picture like the Russian dolls where the smaller one is inside the bigger one. Right. You have fuels in the core, then the reactor vessel, and then the bigger thing called the containment. Well, there is no fuel in the reactor vessel. It's all in the spent fuel pool. So what you do still have, though, is the reactor vessel and then the bigger, the bigger vessel, which is the containment. Now, something has, to, something has to be like a gasket. I'm going to call it a gasket between the reactor vessel flange and the, and the containment because you're going to fill up. You'll fill up the entire volume above that. It makes like a well so that you can move fuel, but you're still out of the reactor vessel, but you're still doing it underwater so you're not going to get, you're not going to get killed by radiation. This, this is highly radioactive fuel. So now that the gate between the spent fuel pool and this well is, is compromised because it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge, huge amount of flow of water between the two bodies of water, and it's not supposed to be that way, but that's just the way it is because well, of damage. Well, isn't that uh, they were servicing number four, right? That's when correct. When the earthquake they, hit? They were, but the gates were installed, but they leaked. And, and that's tr- that was even as recent as January when TEPCO announced that they had a large influx of water into the spent fuel pool that came from the reactor vessel or the refueling, the refueling cavity well. So it acted as if the gates weren't even there. And that got me thinking. I said, wait a minute now. So you're telling me now these gates go all the way, the gate goes all the way down almost to the fuel itself. If you, if you drain the fuel, if you drain the water down to the bottom of the gate, you're almost uncovering fuel. I, and, and what happens fuel, if I, you uncover the fuel? Technically, what happens? Okay, you will have a massive amount of overheating because because water does several things, and the first thing it does is cooling. That's that's an obvious given. That, that and uh, I, I want to get a little bit into that also about the uh, about the numbers we're talking about the horsepower coming out of the fuel. All right, but right but right now, well, yes. The next thing that happens is. Water is a shielding. All right. Now, if you do not shield this, uh, the, the fuel, which is basically, you know, like I said, 30,000 rads, you create shine that can not only affect your access and ability to do anything on Unit 4, but it may actually go straight out to Unit 1. I mean, this, this, this would be, 
a uh, a devastating event. And if that seal now now it's the, the entire spent fuel pool inventory is basically hanging its hat on a seal that's not really meant to be. Uh, this is the seal that goes between. It's a gasket between the reactor vessel uh, flange itself and the uh, containment. If that fails, and this thing is a, it's basically a thin piece of stainless steel with some, you know, like a rubber, a rubber gasket on each side of it. It's meant to give a little, all right. I'm going to say I'm not going to say it's not meant to give a little. But now we also have uh, a building that's in the state of collapse. I mean, that's supposed to have bowed walls, and you can see some of these. You know, some of these pictures are showing bowed walls and everything else. Certainly, there's going to be stresses transferred to the containment, and then some stresses on that transferred yet again to this gasket device called the seal. And really, if it tears, if it rips, if it's just, a, you know, it's, it's, it's not really meant to be exposed to the salt water. If I, if I was a betting man, and I, you know, I'm not really too betting, but I looked at it, I said, well, you don't even need to puncture or collapse the spent fuel pool itself, which is made of stainless steel plate, you know, and, and it's, it's, I know that, 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 that they needed to support this pool. They had to actually go down and, and support it because there was a lot of concrete damage. But if I, if I was going to say what's going to fail, I'd say, well, I'd better address the one. I, I'd like to look at the, the most critical path, okay? There's the one, the one thing that would uh, really ruin your whole day. And it, in my opinion, it would be that seal. And now to support that, uh, Lucas Hickson and I went through uh, prior seal failures, and they're not unheard of. In fact, uh, we doc that's what took a long time. We documented prior operating history on this thing. Yes, you can get a seal failure on a good day. So now we're talking about a really bad day because you have salt water, you have earthquakes, you've got a building that's falling down around it, transferring all kinds of stress. So if the seal, Chris, if the seal fails, the water flow that's, that's covering this enormous amount of highly radioactive fuel, the water will immediately drain from that and leave it exposed, right? Yeah, I think it'll make a whirlpool. I mean, I don't want to be comical about it, but it's actually had made a whirlpool at one of the plants. I think it was Haddam Neck in the early 80s in the United States. And fortunately, there was no, there was no adverse effects just because it was a, it's a different kind of plant. But um, Now, the will the, the, the shielding on the pipes themselves, will, they, will that burst, the, uh, what is it, cronium? Will that burst into flames? Oh, the, uh, you're talking about the uh, fuel tubes? Okay. Yes. Oh, okay, now remember, that, that, that part of it, whereas, whereas uh, you know, plant operations and uh, mechanics and all, and that, that type of engineering, you know, that I can tell you where the, the biggest stresses are. We, uh, it was made, brought to my attention on the 12th that a Dr. Gailey actually calculated when and, and, and what would happen and the consequences of this failure. And uh, I provide that to you, Dr. Bill, and I can talk yeah, about we, we, it. we come back, let's, let's go into that. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes, folks. Center, Earl Sterling, and Chris Harris. Uh, we're in for Dr. Deagle today. We're talking about uh, what else but the Fukushima nightmare and the real dangers to all of us uh, who live on this planet from the absolute radioactive nightmare there. Go ahead, Chris. We were discussing uh, the, 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 all the dangers there. Um, I guess if we could kind of sum it up, what happens? Uh, what's the 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 immediate and long term dangers if number four loses uh, the water? And and by the way, how many tons of radioactive material are stored there? Do you do you know? Or? Yeah, and I'm going to utilize Dr. Gailey's numbers on that since uh, that really is up his alley, and I'm, I find it incredible. He says you will release. Uh, 10 to the 16th becquerels of just cesium, 
10 to the 6, a number with, with or, uh, in fact, it was a 20. Imagine putting a 2 with 16 zeros after it. That's, that's a pretty big number. And, now, to, uh, to, to somebody like me who's not a nuclear engineer, uh, does that mean we're all going to glow in the dark, uh, we're all going to die, or what? What, what, do, what does that mean? And, and uh, it, it, it's, it's a, um, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be 30 to 100 times as great a dose that was released than was released in March. So it's going to be even bigger. If this happens, it could be it could be bigger. It in could be words, quite a bit bigger than Chernobyl, for instance. Yes, it could be much bigger than Chernobyl. So, well, it, they so think it, Chernobyl probably resulted in like what a million deaths over a number of years. And this is the part I, I got up. I you know it, it, that's really not my expertise. I know, but I mean, it just, yeah, nor mine, but I mean, a lot of people have died and a lot of, there have been a lot of babies born severely deformed and everything else uh, from Chernobyl. So we're looking at, we're looking at a, 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 uh, a scenario that will be many times worse and will literally spread throughout the Northern Hemisphere, right? With prevailing winds. That's right, and uh, Dr. Gailey, which is which is really interesting, he he wrote this paper in April, and I had, I was just made aware of it through a uh, a blog on on well actually just uh, on the twelfth on the twelfth, uh, and I said, well, son of a gun, look at this, and uh, all of a sudden uh, he's talking about and he sounds and this is these are the kinds of calculations I'm used to seeing, so I I have uh, some faith in in the numbers and and the methodology he's using. You still have a million watts of of heat energy to be removed by that particular spent fuel pool, and and the cooling system that's iffy because it's you know it's it's a bunch of band aids put together. Now I'm going to tell you some stuff that that based on my personal experience that they're not talking about, but you need water in the spent fuel pool for the cooling system to work. Now I say, well, yeah, that's that's a no brainer, but you need a lot of water, and the reason is. The water comes out of the top. Now, you've seen this uh, swimming pool skimmer, is that correct? They're, they, yeah. they're basically near the top of the swimming pool. Well, you, want to, you also want to do the same thing in this, and that's for, for a lot of reasons. You want to draw the warmest water off. You want to use uh, something that's going to uh, increase the clarity of the water. So what happens is the water basically skims off the top, and it goes into something called a skimmer surge tank. And then you can go to your makeshift pumps, a cooler, and do whatever, and then pump it back in again. What would happen if you can't, if you have a low level in that pool, you, you basically turned off your skimmer. You don't have enough water to even get water out into the cooling system. So these are, these are little nuances that I'm bringing forward. Would that eventually it, boil off? Oh, yeah. If you can't fill it now, if you, if you, lose the seal that I keep on, not to, I'm going to say harping, but yeah, I keep on harping on that seal around the reactor vessel, that gasket. If you lose that, then all your, you got a direct shot to the containment vessel underneath. So all the inventory will go right down to the containment vessel. You can never pump enough water in to establish a level again in the spent fuel pool. In other words, you're done. That's it. That's the only thing I can think of. So do and they have to evacuate? If that happens, do they have to evacuate Tokyo? I, I, oh boy, I, I don't know. Um, if that happens, uh, doc, now go back into Dr. Gailey's realm, and he says what will happen is you will get, we talked about you know popping the cork. I use that on, on things. So you will overheat your fuel assemblies. They will release the two times 10 to the 16th becquerels of just uh of uh, cesium alone, we're not quite. You're not even talking about the strontium, plutonium, the other the other goodies in there. So, if that requires a protective action, such as evacuation, I would say, yeah, something something would have to be done. And uh, I don't think you can even shelter in place at that point because it's really contaminated. You know, I'm looking at contamination. So, I, I mean, we're trying to pick our remedies. Well. We're, we're in a situation because the gates that we talked about initially aren't really holding water anymore, and that the the uh, uh, the level in the refueling vessel pool is affecting the level in the spent fuel. It's not supposed to be like that. You're supposed to have if you've got the gates shut, well, they're supposed to seal nice and tight, and they're not. 
So, and I assume you can't actually get live human beings in there because they'd be dead. You've got to have remotely operated machinery, right? Well, they're, they're working on that. Oddly enough, on Friday, TEPCO installed a metal, not just, not just the plastic cover, but a metal cover that's durable enough to mount equipment on. And that, that has been installed. The announcement was made on Friday. They were constructing it. And uh, I didn't realize that they were actually installing it that 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 soon. I'm, I'm hoping. And that's over number four. Correct. And uh, so that will allow them to put equipment on top of it to reach around and work underneath it. Correct. It looks like it might be able to. Hopefully, they didn't cover the the gates. That way, I, I'm hoping that they left access to the gate so that they can use a crane or something that they could bring up there. Remember, the original crane that's used for that purpose is destroyed. The building is, is gone, and the structure that would support such, such a crane is no longer there. And so the crane bridge itself, and you can see in the picture, just laying down on the – it fell down. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a huge bridge. You know, it's a uh, – you know, so, some of us have operated a crane, a bridge, and a trolley. You know, that's what this is. And uh, – so that's the device you would use to pull these gates out. They're no longer it's no longer intact. So they're going to have to get something up there to do that. And let's let's hope that that, that it can be done. But it may not it, it may not be able to be done quickly. Eventually, they're going to have to they're going to have to fix those. They got to fix the gate and divorce the spent fuel pool side from the reactor cavity well side. So that that you're not relying on that seal anymore. That's why I'm saying it. now it, does, it doesn't it doesn't stop. It doesn't that that eliminates one problem, the the seal, which I still think is probably a greater concern than than the rest of it. But it doesn't it, it doesn't uh, take care of the pool collapse. Now you got to worry. Okay, we took care of that one problem, that, but the pool could still collapse. Now the pool I mean, is built up on on uh, metal, uh, a metal superstructure. And it resides next to or over the um, reactor, correct? It's on the side of the reactor. On the That's side correct. of the reactor, okay. Now, my understanding is the reason that they have kept the spent uh, fuel there for, what, 20, 30 years worth of spent fuel is not a, any good reason. It's because they didn't know what the hell to do with it. So, you, in effect, you have six reactors, but actually seven spent fuel uh, pools at that particular location. And ultimately, the spent fuel pools are more dangerous by far than the reactors because the spent fuel pools have many, many years' worth of fuel in them that are, is still insanely dangerous, Right. Yeah, that is correct, and you can go back to the archives when I was first introduced to Dr. Bill, and I said, you know, that spent fuel pool bothers me even more so than what what's in the core. Right. You know. So it, so we've got we've got seven nightmares, but one of which is getting ready to pop, and we haven't solved that problem yet, not even close. We have to do something, and it has it has. Actions and it caused uh, damage. So, yeah, we got to do something. Alrighty, um, I think this is uh, we're coming to an end here, uh, folks. Uh, pray, so get right with God. Uh, a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world, from Fukushima to potentially a third world war. Uh, thanks for listening. Dr. Bill uh, took a couple days off. He'll be back. And uh, God bless. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.